wild and wonderful places are in short supply. And it's something that I have oftentimes described the conservation movement, the conservation effort, uh, as being a race with no finish line. There's a certain conservation spirit that people of the Commonwealth have. Our state is such a naturally attractive state from east to west, so varied the landscape. So we have to continue to strive to provide funding uh, to provide staffing, to continue to educate the public about the values of these natural areas. When a community has something they can call their own, especially through the Heritage Lands Program, it can be cultural, it can be uh, resource related, it's, it's all positives. It is a, it's a place of their own that they can be proud of. It's a place locally that people can come to and share. They can be educated there, they can share experiences there and it's personal. Where are those places we can go to touch nature, be at peace and have adventures large and small? Kentucky, naturally. The state of Kentucky is made up of more than 24 million acres of land, and over 90% of that land is held privately. The people of the Commonwealth own less than 5% of that acreage in the form of parks, nature preserves, and conservation areas. There are wild places left in the state, and that's due in large part to a program called the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund. It was created in 1994 to be the catalyst for a conservation effort that has brought over 90,000 acres into public hands. It is our state's funding source for the preservation of public lands throughout our state. It was established by the state legislature uh, to direct funding from the sale of nature license plates, from the unmined minerals tax, and from state levied environmental fines to go back into the preservation, conservation, and public use of natural lands throughout our state. I've always said that the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund statute is one of the most common sense pieces of environmental legislation that the Commonwealth has ever passed. Well, one of our goals, again, is to have a place within, you know, 30 minutes or an hour for everybody to go and enjoy. Um, with the Nature Preserves Commission, our goal is to protect habitat for all of our, our rare species and species that are unique to Kentucky. Those really are our two biggest ones. It's kind of a combination of getting people out in nature to recreate and to get away from it all and also give a place for our other critters that, that share Kentucky a place to live as well. The KHLCF is a program of the State Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves that funds five conservation agencies that share 50 percent of the monies raised, with the other 50 percent left for grants for local concerns that are eligible to apply. Once issued, the grants can be used to purchase natural areas that have significance to the Commonwealth. Partnerships are a key component to how the KHLCF leverages its funding to get sites like the Lower Howards Creek State Nature Preserve in Clark County. We're just about half a mile from the Kentucky River, and this is the first creek that you see on the Kentucky River where the Palisades began. So we're a real unique uh, ecological zone. Uh, the Palisades of the Kentucky River has plants that no place else in the state has. So this was a really beautiful area that I explored as a child and my ancestors explored here. And so to see what it's become has been very gratifying for me because even though you see all these beautiful trees here now, 40 years ago there were virtually no trees here. This was an industrial settlement out of Fort Boonesboro. So during the early 19th century, this was quite a large industrial settlement there were 26 different industries here that were all uh, powered. The motive power was water. And so we have, uh, in addition to the wonderful natural resources here, we have some 
fabulous cultural resources. And these date back to Kentucky's earliest uh, recorded history. So when we think about industrial areas, we don't think about nature preserves. So this is 200 years later, uh, we still have these wonderful remnants of the, of the culture that was here, uh, but we also have the plants that have come back with a vengeance. Well, everyone's always floored by, by the spring floral display here. It's, it's, you know, just the amount and the abundance and the diversity of all, all of the plants here. And it, it's, it's, it's pretty spectacular. You don't, you don't really see anything like this anywhere else in the state. Everybody loves it down here, but we found that even when we open up uh, one public trail, we, people are starving to get out in nature. And you have the fine line between loving it to death and allowing it open for visitation. So we're trying to work that out here at Lower Howard's Creek. And um, it certainly is a beautiful area and you know children love it. And I really enjoy bringing people down here whose ancestors lived here maybe 200 years ago, and this is their first visit to the area where their ancestors lived and, and, and produced their families. And I, I just think that's really special. One of the program partners in the KHLCF is the Kentucky State Nature Preserves Wild Rivers Program that oversees the purchase and management of lands around the nine Wild River corridors that were established by the Kentucky Legislature. The Wild Rivers Program started back in the 1970s. Uh, there was a group of lawmakers that saw the need to preserve these natural streams uh, in their free-flowing state. They saw that a lot of our other waterways in the state were being affected by urbanization, by dams, by commercial activities and things. They wanted to make sure that they protected some of these unique river systems, mostly throughout the southeast uh, part of Kentucky here. The mix property sits right above the Rock Castle River. The Rock Castle River is a wild river and uh, is very important because uh, you know, it's a higher quality water stream with better water quality. It's uh, got fast moving water, some of the faster moving water in our stream systems. And then you get these really picturesque, uh, you know, which it's named after rock formations all along and the river flows through this deep ravine in between these rock formations. Hence the reason it's called the Rock Castle. Uh, originally it was called the Lawless River because of its wild nature, which is kind of neat to think about. But, you know, you've got several different plant communities that occur here. They're specialized in threatened or endangered. There's certain endangered mussels found in and around this, uh, the Rock Castle and its tributaries and things. So for that reason, you know, is, is why we're working down here. The Green River is another wild river corridor that has some spectacular places to canoe. Uh, 300 Springs is probably one of the prettiest spots on the Green River. Anybody that lives around South Central Kentucky that, or anybody that goes to the Green River to paddle a lot of times, they know where 300 Springs is. Um, it's this gorgeous, for those of you that haven't seen it, it's this uh, gorgeous series of springs that comes off of a bluff on the Green River that the water kind of trickles down, makes a series of waterfalls on the uh, side of the river. And you have probably a 50 foot, 60 foot rock cliff there that's full of maidenhair fern growing down and you have this setting, it almost looks like something out of, a, out of the jungle or something out of National Geographic. You know, you have this, uh, these waterfalls coming in, these big boulders at the bottom, lots of uh, moss and then these big ferns draping off of it. It definitely doesn't look like something that you'd see as you just drive down the road in Kentucky. Um, it's one of those things that the word has gotten out on it, hopefully to the point to where people appreciate it. If you haven't been down there to it, I'd definitely say get you a canoe, get into the Green River and paddle down and look for 300 springs. That's a great thing to be able to float down a river and not see houses, not see trees cleared to the water, not just because of the the value for the ecosystem and for the natural resource, but also just to kind of feel that solitude with nature and you're alone and out there by yourself, you know. So we're going to be working to, to provide better access for canoes and paddles. I found that kids, they love this stuff, but they're not always exposed to it. And so I think that's the first step is getting that situation where those kids that aren't normally exposed to the outdoors and nature, creating those situations where they come out and experience that. 
Education is one of the principles that the KHLCF was founded on. Sites like Flora Cliff State Nature Preserve serve dual roles of education and conservation in the busy city of Lexington. Well, it's here because of Dr. Mary Wharton. So we're a 287-acre privately owned state nature preserve and she started purchasing the property in the late 1950s and it took her about 30 years to get all 287 acres and she wanted it to be a center for education and research. She believed that if people knew more about their surroundings and the, the trees and the plants and the animals that were around them that they would have a greater appreciation for it and so that's a large part of our focus today is environmental education. All right gigs, I'll come over. Well, it's great for children to interact with the environment, you know, it's, um, and where we are today, it's one of the closest natural areas to Lexington, and, you know, people, families can come out, and uh, when kids come here, they really light up when they get down to the creek, you know, and they just get to explore the little nooks and crannies looking for salamanders, or snails, or frogs, or snakes, and often get to hold things, and it just, it just brings something out in them that, you know, we just, it's just great. We went down to Elk Lake Creek, and along the way we passed Elk Lake Falls, which is the 61-foot waterfall, also a tufa deposit, uh, which is you know, pretty unusual for Kentucky, but in this area of karst topography, you get um, these strange sort of formations that cause the tufa. Um, we went down to the creek, uh, which is a lovely tributary of the Kentucky River in the Palisades region, where all of these tributaries are just sort of a refuge for you know, the plants and animals that live there, and then of course um, the Kentucky River. For children, these places, um, I, I didn't appreciate it growing up because I had a backyard that I could go out into and go out into the woods and play. Kids these days, they don't have that as much. Uh, a lot of people are moving into uh, suburbs and subdivisions and the kids might see a park with a couple of trees planted in it, but they don't get to go out into the woods and experience nature. Uh, the diversity of species you have here, you know, every kid that I've ever been out in the field with, when you take them out into the woods, out into a creek and they start flipping rocks and they start finding crawdads and they start looking for salamanders and they start finding uh, water striders and little bugs that are in the stream, they get excited. Uh, that's something that they're not exposed to. And uh, the funny thing is, the more you expose them to it, they don't get less excited. It doesn't become mundane. They actually get more excited about it. Why do you like coming to a place like this? Because it has lots of animals you can explore and find like toad salamanders and frogs, anything like cool. Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we do here. You know, I think a lot of people ask, you know, so what do you all do? <laughs> you know, we don't just um, spend time, you know, leading hikes and, and workshops, but we spend a lot of time uh, with land management. And so working on invasive species that are here. So that's working on the you know, the bush honeysuckle and garlic mustard and winter creeper. And that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, um, a lot of man hours. And so, you know, I think that's um, something that people don't realize that goes into um, the work of protecting these areas, that it's not just about um, purchasing land, but taking care of the land and being good stewards, you know, once, it, once you have it. The acquisition of the Audubon wetlands near Henderson gave Kentucky State Parks and community partners the ability to create a place where everyone can enjoy access to nature. The opportunity came up for the community to buy this wetland, 650 acres. And what happened was is that the state of Kentucky couldn't go to an auction and buy the property. so. A group of individuals, six of us, went together and we formed a little company and we bought it. And the state can't buy the property for auction, so there was a group of us, me and Robbie and four others that went in together and purchased the property at auction and then we started the process, you know, you had to go through all the people who's going to buy it and finally, after four years, it finally ended up in the state's hands. So we're out here in the summer of 2012, kind of clearing some trails and exploring, seeing what we had got into. And the idea came up, well, you know, if we're ever going to build a boardwalk, this might be the time to do it because the slough was completely dry at that time. 
And so we jumped in and, and funded it ourselves and working with Lee Andrews, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Kentucky State Parks. And um, it went really well. It took, took us five years to get it turned into a park, but here we are. Will has been an inspiration. We're, we're close friends and he's at my farm every weekend. And you think about wheelchair accessibility at the courthouse, at the school, about handicap ramps and what ADA guidelines and plumbing fixtures and all that. But sometimes we don't think about people in wheelchairs or elderly people or small children might want to go out and see a wetland. And as time went on, this really became apparent. And I think today, when we're up here at the wetlands and we've had some older people, and it's just really rewarding to you see an older couple with cameras out here. And I know that they couldn't be going through the mud or you know, going up and down the hills over in the park itself. So here at the wetlands where it's flat, it just lends itself to that. So it's something that has come to us over time I think Will was the inspiration to get us thinking that way. And it's, I think it's exceeded our expectations as to how important it is for the, the mobility impaired public, whether they be elderly people or young people or people in wheelchairs, to be able to come out to a place like this. It's pretty interesting because, it's, well it means a lot because if you look, there's nowhere, not very many places people, well wheelchairs can get around out here, you know or you know the elderly or people the dis disabled people can get out in the the swamp or this kind of property and look around you know the bell, a bell of freedom i guess a little bit of sense of freedom to get out well one of the nicest things about this property is it's not about me it's not about will it's it's for the public it's for the future it's very long term and we want it to live on after all of us I think one of the most rewarding things is to see the management shift over to Kentucky State Parks. And um, I think that is really our goal, is to step out of the way. And of course, we want to donate and help and do things on the side, but I don't want to drive the bus. This is public property now. For the state agencies, a lot of times we have opportunities for federal grants for land acquisition and management but those federal grants require a non-federal match. So you have to have some sort of dollar that isn't associated with a federal grant in order to receive additional monies. That's where the Heritage Board funding comes in is uh, we can actually leverage a dollar of state funds through license plate sales to bring in federal dollars at a two to one match, at a three to one match in order to leverage a little bit of dollars here to get a whole lot of money to go out and protect these areas. The need for recreation is something we all experience. Places like the Ballard Wildlife Management Area in Ballard County and the Yellow Banks State Wildlife Management Area in Meade County were created with recreation in mind. They also generate opportunities for research and conservation of endangered habitats of plants and animals. The Ballard Wildlife Area was actually purchased probably in the mid to late 50s. Um, it was originally purchased for a waterfowl area. With the Mississippi Flyway being right here on top of us, it was a good area to have and to have public access and public hunting opportunity. So now the area is geared more towards the duck management and uh, we have several thousand people come through the area every year just for waterfowl season. Besides waterfowl, um, we do have some dove hunting opportunity. Uh, the guys put out some dove fields to uh, to have the public where they can come in and hunt doves. Of course, it's open to a lot of the statewide seasons, so you can come down here and you can squirrel hunt and dove hunt. It shuts down for waterfowl though. Uh, we have some, some deer hunting opportunity as well. You can bow hunt and we have a, uh, a quota gun hunt on the area too. There's a lot of people that come down just to bird watch and it's not just the little songbirds that everybody thinks about. I mean, it's the waterfowl too. We keep our front loop open that is, has the front slough in it. So you can actually see some of the waterfowl during the waterfowl season, but in the early spring, there's a lot of people that come down and look at the birds, and there's actually a society pretty close that comes down just to look at butterflies too. 
there's a lot of a lot of edu education opportunities that we've kind of looked at over the years and and trying to branch out a little bit more and, and get more people coming through too. Recreation and conservation are important objectives to the people involved with the KHLCF and scientific research into endangered habitats and species is essential for success. Bat populations have dropped to dangerous levels due to white nose syndrome, so scientists from several different agencies have been working together to see just how bats are being impacted. But why are the numbers going down? Are the adults dying on the landscape? Are the females so heavily impacted during the winter with this disease that they're not able to um, get pregnant and have their young or nurse them properly? Are they surviving? Are they reproducing? So are the numbers going down through natural death of the adults and there's just no recruitment or no young animals coming in? That's what we wanted to get at this summer. This past year what we started doing is going to roost trees that we knew had good maternity populations of Indiana bats in the past. Uh, we would erect, uh, they're called mist nets, a drill fine netting around these structures and would actually capture the bats as they emerge from the roost. And then we would look at each one individually, put a band on it so that we can track them from year to year, but we would be able to see with Indiana bats, which are federally protected species, are they showing some recruitment. Uh, fortunately, we did see some recruitment within this species and uh, this is this was year one of a long-term study, so hopefully that trend will continue. Uh, the problem with bats is that they're a long-lived species. They only have one pup a season, so you're seeing a drastic decline in their populations in some of these caves of upwards of 90%. So you're hoping, and we're hoping, that whatever resident population we have has that's able to survive white nose has some sort of immunity to it and that it's going to take a long road obviously because of how slow they are to have more pups but we'll hopefully decades down the road see some additional recruitment and see these populations rebound. Bats play an extremely important role in the environment. They a lot of folks don't understand what they're out there for. It's like, oh, what good is a bat? But they do a lot of really interesting things. And here in Kentucky, they serve as an, a really good nighttime predator. They eat lots of insects and moths. And folks may say, well, pff, what difference does that make? But if you're a wheat farmer or something else, you understand the significance of some of these nighttime predators. And so they play that nighttime role of predator control for insects. So much of what the KHLCF has been able to achieve has been because people want to become involved. From the purchase of license plates to the idea of having family lands conserved, it's taken the hard work and determination of people from all walks of life to get things accomplished. And I'm so proud of our program because it allows citizens of the Commonwealth really to speak up for nature by purchasing a nature's finest license plate. Proceeds from the sale of that plate help fund the purchase of natural areas, perhaps in your own community. I think for some families, the decision to participate with conservation programs like the Heritage Land Fund, it really is a deep conviction that they have about what they would like to see happen to that land. It might be that they see the um, added value in what can be done with their property with some additional management and the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund provides funding not only for the acquisition of these lands but also for the management of those lands that would support either public use or the preservation of habitats for rare threatened and endangered species. One of the missions in the Nature Preserves Act that established the Nature Preserves Commissions um, is to, to give places to protect the spiritual value of our outdoors. It's not all about science and not all about conservation. It's also good for people, and I think that's something we overlook sometimes. One of the reasons that the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund was created was to conserve places for people to enjoy in the future. An ambitious plan to create a 120-mile-long hiking trail in eastern Kentucky has begun with over 40 miles of trail already in place. If you've never heard of the Pine Mountain State Trail, of course you think, all right, we know it's in Eastern Kentucky, it's Pine Mountain. If anyone's ever been to Pine Mountain State Resort Park, they kind of know we're over there in Bell County. 
But actually, it's a lot bigger than that. It starts all the way at the end of the state and actually a little bit of our part of Virginia. It breaks Interstate Park. And if you go all the way there and start, you're going to come 120 miles back toward Pine Mountain and Cumberland Gap uh, National Park. And what it does is this park is a linear park, which just means in the layman's terms, is you are following a little short section of the ridge line of Pine Mountain. You can go, say you're at Kingdom Come and you start there and you're kind of heading back east. You're going to be at 3,200 feet elevation. You're going to see that north face of the Pine Mountain and you're going to see just beautiful views, wonderful hemlock blends. But you're definitely going to come across a lot of things you will not see anywhere else in the state. Pine Mountain also has the Blanton State Nature Preserve which contains one of the largest sections of old growth forest left in the state. It's become a draw for tourists from all over the world. It, it actually brings uh, a, a degree of tourism to the area because it's uh, pretty popular on, uh, you know, with, with um, social media and, and the internet and everything today, you know, it's pretty much out there that, that it's there and, and there's, there's people from uh, I've met many people from different areas that, you know, in different states, different countries that actually come to that area and Blanton Forest is like one of their stops, you know, and uh, I just want them to come back. I want them to come away with a feeling that they love it, you know, and that, that they're so glad that it, that, 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 it, that it was able to be preserved, you know, and, uh, and for future generations. There are still wild places in Kentucky some hidden, some boldly visible, because of the conviction that we need to preserve Kentucky's natural treasures. One of our goals with the Heritage Land Fund is we want to have a conservation area in every county in Kentucky where local folks and tourists alike can go and enjoy the outdoors. Right now we're in about uh, 70 of those counties, so we have a ways to go. But um, that's a goal because every kid in Kentucky and every kid that visits Kentucky needs to be able to experience a place like this. Our state is such a naturally attractive state from east to west, so varied the landscape. From the mountains of eastern Kentucky to the rich diversity of the Green River of the central Kentucky area uh, to the wetlands and prairies of western Kentucky. And citizens from each of those regions of our state um, realize that they don't make these lands anymore. So we have to continue to strive to provide um, funding, uh, to pro provide staffing, to continue to educate the public about the values of these natural areas. We all have individual responsibilities to be responsible stewards of the land and to leave a little bit of it for those yet to come. Production funding for Kentucky Naturally comes in part from the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund and from supporting members of WKU-PBS.